Hi everyone, this is Donato Cabrera. I'm the music director of the Las Vegas Philharmonic and the California Symphony. Uh, we are uh, coming to you a week late, but we are so excited to, uh, I am incredibly excited to be uh, chatting with my friend and such a such an icon of the Las Vegas music scene. He, uh, ever since I've been the music director of the Las Vegas Philharmonic, Clinton, Clint has welcomed me with open arms. We've uh, had the opportunity to work together and to, uh, and to just, just get to know one another. And it is my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome Clint Holmes to Music Wise. Hi, Clint. How are you, Donato? Well, that's the greatest introduction I ever had. Oh, <laughs> well, it's, it is, it, every word of it was meant. And, and, uh, and I just, I, 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 it is true that you, uh, you know, listen, we, we know this about Las Vegas, that um, it, it's full of incredible people that are so, uh, if you just moved to Las Vegas, everyone knows what it's like to, to go to a city like that for the, for the first time, to move to a new city. And it seems like um, that open arm feeling is is really a, apparent there, more so than other places. What do you, do you I, no, I, I, absolutely, I absolutely agree. I think that it's a, it's a small community. It's an incredibly active and vibrant city, but it's a small community. And um, I think we welcome each other. I, when I, I came to Vegas in 1999. Um, mm -hmm. Wynn brought me out to play the Golden Nugget. And mm -hmm. I had been here before a weekend with Don Rickles, you know, like that, but never lived here and never known you know had any friends here immediately i mean immediately i was i was welcomed other entertainers would come i'd get calls you know come by this club there's a great hang tonight and blah blah, blah. and it was it was really by the by the time my family came out you know they were like holy cow you know there's so many people that you get to know quickly here um so yeah i, I think it's a great town to to uh enter and be welcomed you know um we're, we have so much to talk about, but I wanted to play one of the uh, one of the videos that you shared with us first. Okay. Uh, you, you shared with us. Uh, I'd like to play the town hall performance that you shared with us. Can, just to sort of give a, a, we'll talk about more in detail after we hear it, but just to start to set the scene of this. Hey, incredible oh, oh, oh. Performance. There were six songs on there. You got the second one, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, that I really that was a very important uh, learning experience for me. Um, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit afterwards. But what, what it was, was as I kind of transitioned from only being uh, just a Las Vegas performer to opening up the world, which to me is New York, you know, uh, uh, I, had to, I had to really learn about what's expected um, uh, in New York. And how, how to, and, and basically by that, I mean, I, for the first time I ever had a, a director someone who worked with me on on what we were doing and how we were doing it and the underbelly of how we were producing it. And this, uh, well, I don't know how much I should say before, but let me put it to you this way. There is a, this is a very definite character we created, this person who sang these two great songs. And it was rewarded by um, uh, uh, winning an award for best uh, a singer, cabaret singer that year. And, uh, right. and invited to town hall to to uh, to perform it. So it was it, for me. It was a real a real valid valid. What, what's the word? A validation of what I was trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically afterwards. But great. Let's watch it. Okay. Once I laughed when I heard you say that I would be playing solitaire, uneasy in my easy chair. It never entered my mind. Once you told me that I was mistaken. I would awaken with the sun and order orange juice for one. It never entered my mind. 
You have what I lack myself. And now I even have to scratch my back myself. Once you warned me that if you scorned me, I'd sing a lonely prayer again and wish that you were heaven. To get into my hell again, it never entered. The sun comes up, I think about you. The coffee cup, I think about you. I want you so. It's like I'm losing my mind. The morning ends, I think about you. I talk to friends, and I think about you. And do they know it's like I'm losing my mind? All afternoon, doing every little chore, the thought of you stays bright. Sometimes I stand in the middle of the floor, not going left, not going right. I dim the lights and think about you. Spent sleepless nights to think about you. You said you loved me. Or were you just being kind? Okay, first of all, incredible, incredible performance. Tell us about the song and your, your, accomp your accomplice. Uh, from here in Vegas, uh, oh, me, okay, we yeah. were uh, yeah. in, in the middle of playing the Cafe Carlisle that, 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 during that period of time. Um, and uh, we worked that out. It's, it's, I, you know, it, it's interesting to watch it. Uh, so I have a wonderful coach. His name is Larry Moss. Larry um, is uh, uh, a, an acting coach. He, he works with literally everyone from Leonardo DiCaprio to uh, Helen Hunt, on and on and on. And we uh, became friends. He came to see me here in Vegas. We became friends. And when I started to go to New York, he was the one who came to me and he said, look, he said, I see your tricks. I see how you get over. I, I, I see all the things that you do. 
he said, but in New York, a lot of those things will be perceived as, as tricks and you are capable of more. And we started getting the underbelly of the songs and the underbelly of the entire program that we were putting together. It, it, they almost are mini plays, if you will, you know, uh, the cabaret and, and the, those kind of performances. And in this particular thing, of course, the, the two great songs, one Cole Porter, one uh, Stephen Sondheim, we decided that this guy was a 57-year-old wealthy playboy who uh, had a place in the Hamptons and uh, just whatever his pleasure of the week was. He'd meet somebody at a party and he'd say, hey, come to the Hamptons with me this week, right? And so he meets this woman who says to him, I'll come, but I'm not one of them. I am not. If you mess with me, you're going to pay the price. And in his mind, he went, whatever, you know, then they're done that. She's just another woman. And um, so they have a wonderful weekend. They come back to New York um, and he meets someone else and he takes her out. And then he calls this one back and she says, I told you, I'm not one of them. I don't want to be with you. I don't want to. And for the first time in his life, he is struck with the fact that he is being done to by someone what he has done to so many women in the past. And so the whole performance was meant to be incredulous. And, and then mm -hmm. at the end of the performance, kind of bereft. And 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 were you just when you said you loved me, you were just being kind. What? <laughs> you know, I mean, this yeah. is totally foreign territory for this guy. And the other thing that um I, I like about the performance is the stillness of it. Yeah. Um, I, I never grab the mic and I, 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 you know, that's, that's a real exercise because, you know, we're about motion as much as we uh, emotion and motion kind of go hand in hand. But for this guy, I think it, it, it really was effective to, to, to not have much motion. Well, what, what I love so much about this performance and I want to delve into what it means to you about the cabaret and and because it's it's such a unique uh art form unto itself it's not like you it's not like singing in a club it's not like cutting an album it's not like singing in front of a band that's so that's we'll talk about that in a minute but what i love so much about every time i've seen you sing clint and it's i'm not i'm not being uh I'm not saying this just to because you're on this show, but it's true. You have such a dedication to the word and what you created this particular performance. It's, it's, it's conversational singing. It's, it's, it's yeah. that sort of in between world of yes, you're singing the lyrics, you're singing the melody, but you're singing it in a way that is so conversational. It's like you're having a conversation with every single person watching that performance. And I'm curious to know if this is something that as we all, as all, all of us are artists, we, we're constantly learning, we're constantly growing. Right. Is this a skill that has been there all along or was this something about the, the characteriza characterization of the of I the never, I've always loved lyrics. And yeah. before we forget this, I just wanna say this, we are so blessed to have Cabaret, Myron's Cabaret Jazz as a room to work like that. Right. Total and a total listening room where no one is doing anything but listening. Okay, so uh, we're we're so blessed to have that that room here. Um, I've always loved lyric. I, I'm a, I'm a lyricist. I write, you know, and and so I love lyrics. But I don't think I've ever been so invested in them since I started working with with Larry Moss. Mm -hmm. um, for, let me give you an example. Um, what's the great Cole Porter song? Um, uh, uh, Da, 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 and the night is clear. And if you want to go walking, it's delightful. It's de right. It's, right? It's, it's so we were we were rehearsing that song, and he said to me, he "said So what's the song about?" And I, and I said, "Oh, you know, it's a it's a guy who's trying to convince this girl to take a walk with him." And we he said, "Well, who's the guy?" And I said, "Well, okay, it's me." And he goes, "Okay, so why won't she take the walk with you? Does she like you?" Well, he, he, I guess so. Yeah. He said, "Don't guess so. Does she like you?" Well. Yes. Well, then why won't she take the walk with you? Uh, and we examine it. And, oh, OK, her parents don't like me. Her parents don't want her going out with a singer. So I have to be charming enough 
to convince her without being smarmy, which is what her parents told me that I was. So all of a sudden, it, it's not just delightful. It's the, it's it's a whole convincing. There's a hurdle. There there's those kind of things. Uh, every I try. I would like to say that every song I I do, I examine. I, I can't be honest and say that, but uh, I, I should. Uh, I, and I do more often than not examine the songs and find what's under them. Right, right. And of course, with, with you know, there are lyrics and there are lyrics. Right, of course. When you sing a song by Stephen Sondheim, you can't help but create a, an incredible intricate backstory, in my opinion, because right. I, they are, there's such an intellectualism, in, and not in an off-putting way to Stephen Sondheim, but there's, there is, there is some, you have to dive, you have to dive deep beyond yeah. the lyrics and the rhythms and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the notes, right? When I when I teach, I I, I play that video for for and I, it's two videos I play before we start. One of them is me in nineteen I'm going to say eighty, really nice looking suit, nice looking guy singing uh, on the People's Choice Awards a song uh, called One One. Anyway, a big you know We Are the World kind of song. Yeah, and, and it's great. And and there's a choir and there's a thing and 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 he sings it great. That guy, right? Right. And then it goes off and it's like, well, that was really nice. There's no more. There's, it was, he's hit all the notes. He looked great. The song was okay, blah, 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 blah. And then I play this. Right. And they, do you understand how much more there was to, to this? And it took me years to learn that, right? Um, so, so I think it's a teaching thing and I think it's a really important thing and, and uh, yes, the, the, the Sondheims of the world, and even some of the contemporary writers, like John Mayer, writes some pretty interesting lyrics that you got to climb into, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I don't really want to think anything that, that's not anymore that's not really interesting, you know? I think we, we reach a point, you know, we have, our, we have our moment in our lives when we're younger where we'll just say, we'll do anything, because we're just, we <laughs> want to be. We and and that's a good thing. We want to we want to jump into anything that it may have water in it and may not. But that's you know we're we're gonna take that jump as we should. And I think as we get older, we realize what our strengths and weaknesses are, what we know we can do well, what we can't do well, what we need to improve upon, etc., etc., etc. Talk about I, for the for those of us who have never walked walked into Cafe Carlisle, which is sort of like, you know, you're, you're going to church when you, when you, I mean, what an incredible honor it must have been for you to sing at Cafe Carlisle. Talk a little, t tell, tell those of us who are watching, what is Car Cafe Carlisle, what it means in the world of cabaret. And then let's talk a little bit more about Myron's Cabaret Jazz because it's, it, it, we're, we are indeed so lucky to have something like a Cafe Carlisle in Las Vegas. Right. Well, I'll, I'll go one step further with the Carlisle. Um, years and years and years ago, uh, when I, in the, I'm in the, the late 70s, when I just started, I was in New York and someone invited me to go to hear Bobby Short at the Cafe Carlisle. And Bobby Short held court there for years and years and years. It was basically his room. It was synonymous. He was synonymous with it. Uh, and I'm this idiot. I don't know anything. I go, okay. So I go over there and there's a bottle of Dom Perignon at the, at the table this guy had ordered who invited me and I'm sitting there and there's this incredibleness of this little tiny 90 seat room. It, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And there's Bobby Short up there at the piano with his tuxedo on being all elegant and uh, you know, being uniquely one of a kind and all of those things. So that was my first um, uh, introduction to the Cafe Carlisle. So I revered it all these years. I revered it, but never worked there. Along comes um, a lady, um, a produ producer who saw me in Florida and said, uh, have you ever heard of Bobby Short? And I said, of course. And, and uh, he said, do you like his music? And I said, well, I, I've been a fan forever and ever and ever. And he said, would you like to do a tribute to Bobby Short at the Cafe Carlisle? And she said, I'd like, I've been waiting years to produce one and you're the guy I'd like to do it with. So of course I said, yes. And um, I did a lot, a lot of research. I went to New York. I, 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 talk, I talked to the people who knew him best, um, some of his family members. And we put together this very, uh, what turned out to be successful uh, tribute to Bobby 
I was the first person to ever do a tribute to Bobby Short at the Cafe Carlisle. I mean, what did you did you have a moment a moment of hesitation because that was that Bobby Shore and Cafe. I mean, that's sort of the non plus ultra of cabaret. Right. It wasn't hesitation. What it was was let's sit down and figure this out. I'm not going to do an impression. I'm not going to try to do an impression of Bobby Short. Um, uh, I I I, I want to honor obviously honor him. So what we decided to do was take material, uh, form it into a, 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 a flow of an evening that everything made sense. It, it, it was his era here and his era there. And why did he sing this song? Because it was his mother's favorite song and his mother had tea parties. So it was tea for two. And, and, and so we, we, we put it into, it made it a, 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 a mini play. It wasn't a play, but it was, a, it had definitely a, had a reason to be. And, um, uh, and we did it, and it was interesting because the Times uh, reporter at the time, Bob, oh God, what was his name? Sheldon, Shelton. Um, we knew was very close friends with Bobby Short, as well as the reviewer for the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want him to come in and say, "Well, you know, what's this got to do with Bobby Short?" Or, "Well, this guy's trying to be Bobby Short," or any of those things. Uh, and and we were really lucky. He got what we were doing, and he gave us a great review, which set the thing off to be successful. You know. So it wasn't a fear of doing it. It was more of a, uh, we wanted to do it right. And right. we spent a lot of time figuring out what right was. Did you know that Bobby Short was, there's a statue of Duke Ellington um, uh, at the foot of, at the, at the head or the foot, however you want to regard it, of Central Park in Harlem. Yeah. And yeah. Bobby Short was the one who uh, raised a lot of the money and went to the wall to have that made because he had an issue with being perceived as an African-American performer. And he wanted very much to leave his mark on, on African-American performers. So he took Duke Ellington as a great example of someone totally respected. And it was, it was like his, his uh, piece de resistance, you know? So I went, I went there and, and spent an afternoon just kind of walking around it, sitting and looking at it. And we, we did a section of the show. And I was surprised at how many New Yorkers didn't know he had anything to do with that statue. I didn't know that. I, yeah. I didn't. I, and I lived in New York for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it was that kind of thing. It was really right. discovering what we could discover. So that was my introduction, my introduction to the Carlisle. And I, I performed there, I guess, four. I have performed there four or five um, more times since then. Not in a while. Not in a while. What's it like as a, as a performer? You've sung in all sorts of venues I can only imagine. Uh, but when you sing it in, <laughs> when you, oh yeah. Um, but when you sing in a place like uh, the Cafe Carlisle or, or Cabaret Jazz, where mo more than likely you're going to have an aficionado, yeah. a group of aficionados there that will know the songs you're singing, that will appreciate the art form in and of itself, What's that like? Is there a diff is is it some is there is there a palpable difference for you as a performer to sing to that type of audience as opposed to say a showroom? Yes, uh, and, and the difference is this: in a showroom, um, even at Harris, where I I performed for seven years and pretty much people knew what they were coming to see, you still were performing for a whole lot of people who had no idea who you were, you know. Right. And uh, the 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 husband whose wife insisted that they see a show that was the, the bargaining chip for him gambling for three hours later on, you know, all of those things. So in that situation, you got to come out and you've got to get them, as they say, right away. The, the songs have to be familiar. They have to probably, for the most part, have to be up tempo. They, they, you know, you have to really establish that as, as the reason you're there. Whereas in Myron's or, uh, Carlisle uh, or, or Birdland, where, where I've been working the past few years, you can come out and sing three ballads if, if there's a reason to do it. And everyone will stay right there with you because mm -hmm. they can hear the music and they appreciate the nuance. And, and uh, they're surprised. They, they, they don't get like, oh, I don't know that song. That's another thing that, that you get a lot in the casinos. Is, I don't know that. So why are you singing songs we don't know? Right. <laughs> um, and whereas in, in those kind of situations, they expect to, to be introduced to new writers, new songs, new new ways of hearing a song they've heard a hundred times, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the difference. And I yeah. love both. I mean, uh, I still love going out in a casino stage and and going here we are, everybody, bam, you know. <laughs> so I love both, and I get to do both, which is great. 
let's talk about the process of, of you just mentioned uh, a new song from the audience point of view. Uh, what's it like for you learning a new song? What, what's your process of finding new material, working with the composer? Um, talk a little bit about that process. Well, for me, it's usually being moved by something I hear. You know, mm -hmm. it is not, oh, that's a nice song. Oh, I like that song. I think I'll sing it. it it's really got to move me. And, and, and by that, I, I don't mean it has to be a huge emotional movement. It can, it can be uh, just so much fun that I just have to sing it. It can be that too, right? right. So uh, I don't always know the composer. Uh, 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 you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I'm doing more and more original mu of my own music. You know, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so so the, the, the basic idea is the song, if I hear a new song I've never heard before and it moves me, I make note of it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll write it in my things to do list and then I'll go back. And if it still moves me to the point that I want to sing it, then I'll start to learn it and investigate it. I heard that Lena Horne would uh, say a song, not sing a song, say a song a hundred times before she would ever start to sing it because she felt like it had to be absolutely in her body, in her psyche before she would uh, uh, consider singing it. Now, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but it makes sense, you know. Someone, you can see that when she performs. It's like, she's like living. She's really living every sentence. Man, did you see her lady, was it Lady in Her Music? That yeah. incredible show she did when she was 70 years old. I got to see it live and I've seen it since. Um, the genius of singing Stormy Weather in the first act, like she sang it in the movie all those years ago, and then singing it in the second act of about her life and right. about the loss of a child and the loss of a husband, and then singing that song like, woo! Uh, you know, I still get chills when I see stuff like that. You know, you know I, the, I, I'm a huge fan of cabaret, uh, the cabaret art form, and I often think of, of her and, and that show in particular, yeah. but also, you know, these, these artists like Elaine Stritch, who, yeah. are so brutally on, who are so brutally honest on stage about their life. And, their, and, and someone like Elaine, you know, she has, she's had some bumpy, bumpy, bumpy uh, moments along, along the road that she, she took. And I, that honesty, and you share, you, you, there is this, there is a sense of, of really, of fearlessness. Mm. You know, you get on stage and you, and, and you really, I, and when, when I see you sing, you, you just really share yourself. And I think that vulnerability is, uh, I don't know what, I want to talk a little bit about, about, about your teaching, because you, you, right before we started, you said, oh, you're doing some teaching. And you brought, what, up, you brought up Elaine Stritch. Yes. Okay. So. Kelly and I were fortunate enough to see her uh, towards the, the very end at, at the Cafe Carla. I was, yeah. I, I believe we were, I was opening the next week and we were there on a Saturday. Anyway, we went, she could not remember the lyrics to most of the songs. She could not remember what, what the, she, she'd start a story and turn to her accompanist and say, what the hell is that story? Where, where were we? Was that in Paris? Or where, where was that? You know, like that. Um, and, and we sat there totally transfixed and totally in on something. It wasn't like, oh, I feel sorry for her or, or oh, it was more like this person who has built a career being totally and brutally and raw, uh, honest, is now being honest in her total vulnerability. And, right. and it was really a, a, a moment of that night. Well, I, know, I think Kelly and I will ne never forget it. It was a we'll sure. performance like that again. She came in to my rehearsal, because uh, she lived at the Carlisle. Uh, right. The following Monday, we were in there rehearsing, and we look in the back of the room, and there's Elaine with somebody just standing there. And uh, and I'm like, you know, we finished whatever we were rehearsing, and uh, she goes, they'll love you, kid, they'll love you, and walks out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but 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 her voice was probably an octave lower than what you just yeah, did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was pretty special, pretty special time seeing her. Yeah. But but talking about this vulnerability, you know, um, and it, and also just the idea of living the word. You do some teaching, and and I want to know if you how how you access what what you tell your your students about about research about 
um, of, uh, access to the emotions and maybe even taking acting classes. What, what are what are your thoughts on that for it younger? Is, it is an acting class. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, because a, a lot of us, uh, and I, myself included, uh, sing a song because we have a good voice. And, and that's what Larry was saying to me early on. You know, I see your tricks. I get it. You know, <laughs> I get you over there, you wink at somebody and they go, oh, that's great. Ah. You know, right? Uh, so what I, I try to break, the, I try to help uh, the students break the song down. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the quick question, what's it about, right? And there's usually an answer that's kind of surfacy. You know, yeah. about a girl that fell in love with a guy. Well, then you go, oh, okay, and, and what happened? You know, right. what happened? Why are they singing this lyric now? And mm -hmm. then you get the, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> right. And that's when you start, you know? Yeah. Uh, can I tell you a story that really will, will give you the example of, of what I learned and how I learned it and what I tend to give Please. the kids? Okay. Please. Okay, so you know the song Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. the, the, Leonard, the Leonard Cohen song. Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was singing that song for quite a while. Yeah. And Kelly and I were in New York and we went to one of Larry's acting classes and, and these are, He'll, he'll have 36 students and they're all real working actors who are diving in, right? Mm -hmm. And we were just auditing the class. We weren't in the class. So uh, came time for lunch and Larry said, uh, I have a friend here from Las Vegas and, uh, and I'd love to ask him to come down and sing a song. And I'm like, oh God, no, 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 no. There's no piano. This is like, you know, and these people have been pouring their hearts and souls into the thing. And he's going to ask me to come down. So I go down <laughs> and I stand there and little beads of sweat coming on my head. And he says, you know, I, I want you to sing that song, Hallelujah, because I've heard you singing it in Las Vegas. I'm, okay. Donato, I stood there. I couldn't remember a single word of the song. Couldn't remember how the song started. Couldn't remember anything about it. I just stood there. And Larry said, breathe, breathe. And he gave me the opening lyric. I said, okay. And I sang it and something took over. And by the end of it, I was barely being able to sing it. The people sitting there were crying. And Larry said, here's the deal. You subconsciously know what you're singing about, but you have not allowed yourself to consciously know what it is. He said, you're singing to your father. You're singing to your father. Think about that. Okay. I was brought up in a household where my, my mother was a white British opera singer. My dad was a black American jazz singer, right? They met during World War II and came over. My dad never got to, well, neither one of them really ever got to fulfill their dream, you know, mm -hmm. continuing their career. But when I was five and my mother saw me sing, whatever I sang, I became the dream. I became the golden child. I became the one that mom loved, and which, and as I had some success, it became even more apparent that my mom was giving me way more attention than she should compared to my dad. So my dad and I had a, a relationship that was, I mean, my dad loved me and, and, and all of that, but he could never quite give it up. He could never. And I always wondered why can't my dad just say, Hey, great show, son. You know, why would he always come back and say, where do you go to have fun around here? You know, it was that kind of a relationship. It was, it was just difficult. Um, so, Here's the song. Uh, well, now I won't be able to remember the beginning of the song. Uh, I heard there was a secret chord that David played, and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you, Dad? It goes like this. The fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, but the major lift. The baffled king composing, hallelujah, Dad. You gave me this, hallelujah. Uh, your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her, Mom, bathing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. She, she, uh, she, uh, she took your power. She broke your throne. She cut your hair. She took your power. And from your lips, she drew the hallelujah. So, Dad, it's okay. It's okay. Hallelujah. Uh, you say I took the name in vain. I don't even know the name. And if I did, really, what's it to you? There's a blaze of light in every word. And it doesn't matter if I heard the, the broken or the holy hallelujah. Dad, I'm just singing hallelujah. Thank you for this. Thank you for the gift. Last verse. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. 
And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue, but hallelujah, nothing on my tongue, but thank you, Dad. So once I understood what that song meant to me on a deep level, when I sing it, all of that is in there. And people don't know why they're moved, but they're moved because I'm telling a story. And that's what I try to teach students. That's my story. There's a billion people who sing hallelujah. And, and, and it's beautifully done by everybody. But my version is my version. And my that, that is, story. Don't thank you so much for sharing that insight because, you know, we, we often try to explain and it, and it doesn't usually work because music is music and words are words. And, and, and music has something beyond what we can describe. But that is so beautifully put, Clint, because we all are, when we, when we reinterpret a song now, there's, I want to talk about your own composition. But when, we, when I conduct Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, I can try as hard as I can muster to sound like, sound, make the orchestra sound like my favorite recording. But or or recreates a, 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 a performance of a conductor who I admire. But the reality is that performance of that symphony or your performance of Leonard Cohen's Alleluia can only be your own. Yeah. It, right. it can only be your own. And the more you the more you uncover those connections, those personal connections to that piece of music. Subconsciously, like you had done be with Hallelujah before yeah. that acting class, and then also consciously, that that discovery is what is connecting people to the performance. Absolutely, and people don't know that, and they don't need to know that. That's all, right. All they need to be is moved. You know, they, they they just need to be moved. And I've had people come up to me after Hallelujah in a show, and they'll say, "I know you love the Lord, and I know that you were singing that," and and I go. I do, and thank you very much. You know, <laughs> and that's fine. You know, it's fine. They were moved. Uh, they got it. And and uh, uh, my wife just walked in. What, honey? Well, I can't ask you on this. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm talking to Donato Cabrera. I know. I, know I interrupted you. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Sometimes she walks in to say, "Shut up." <laughs> yes, dear. Uh, oh, you're right. You're right. And and I get frustrated um, because again, there are so many good singers uh, in this city who don't invest that 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 time and and th that energy to to really understand or figure out why do I want to sing it? What do I have to offer that's unique to it? And if I don't have that, then don't sing it. I mean, that's my opinion. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's what we have to offer. That's, that's right. What we have to offer as artists. I was going to ask you a little bit about. You've already shared a very profound moment of your upbringing and and the reasons behind. Um, but for you, from your point of view, as far as you can remember, I know I, I always try and when people ask me, well, when when did you start getting well, like you know, <laughs> who knows? But um, from that. <laughs> five-year-old's point of view or that 10-year-old's point of view. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's obvious, of course, that to having two parents who were singers right. certainly played a role in that. But from your own discovery, what were what are some of the memories that you can share with us that just got you? Was it this, the performances you heard on the radio or the, a record or a live performance or hearing your parents sing? What what were those what were those moments for you? It was the Ed Sullivan show. It, it was it was the fact that that was a family event, literally. You know, the the one thing that we would always do is Sunday night. My sister and I would take our baths, and then we would watch the Ed Sullivan show. And my mom would love uh, uh, Victor Borga, right? And and my dad would love Nat King Cole, and I would love the Beatles. And 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 but but there was always something for for, for all of us, and. So that was kind of like Dreamville. That and um, uh, uh, Mickey Mouse Club. Those are my Dreamville places, you know. In California, we lived in a small town outside of Buffalo, New York, about 20 miles outside of Buffalo, uh, but because my dad moved us there uh, to be safe, you know, because wow. they had a bunch of stuff in Buffalo. They moved uh, to this little 500 
50 people in the whole town. So this was Dreamville, you know, watching Mickey Mouse Club and he had some Annette Minichello. <laughs> Annette Minichello, dude. <laughs> and uh, uh, and um, when I, and being in this little town, we were the only family of color in town. So I was very different in the school. It was a lot of Militello and Paternostro and, you know, and, and this little half brown and whatever kid, right? And um, so one day, and I tell this story, I have a play that I wrote and then I have, I tell the story in the play. I don't remember first grade, second grade, but one day I said to the teacher, can I, can I sing? Can I sing a song? And she probably went, sure, you know, right? <laughs> and I sang, here comes Peter Cottontail. And when I finished it, they applauded. And I went, okay. Yeah, okay. like, oh, they I like, like that. They like me. They like me. Sally Fields. They like me. I did. I, I, I have to, exactly. They like me. They like um, me. <laughs> I, I have, have, a, I have a similar story. No, I have a very similar story. I think it was third grade for me, and and I remember I was so happy that I had memorized this song on the piano. Uh -huh. I think it was called spinning song or something. And I, yeah, exactly. And so I asked my teacher, I said, can I play this song for, for the class? Why did I even think of doing that? And he said, sure, because there was a piano in the class and I did it and, and everyone did most, first of all, most of the kids in my class didn't even know I played the piano. And then I, I, I did that and they, you know, I got this applause and it's sort of, oh, that's so cool. And I thought, oh, I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Stars born. I mean, you know, so I think for me, it really was, it was mom and dad, but it was also, uh, here's the place I fit. You know, Here, here's the place where my mom loves me when I get up and tap dance or sing or, 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 or whatever, you know. And as I got, when I was about 12, my dad uh, took me into, my dad had, had this, it was, it's, it's still in Buffalo. It's called the Colored Musicians Club. It's still there. It's a landmark now. But my dad used to go there like on a Friday night by himself. He'd take mom to dinner and then he'd go into Buffalo, right? So they started doing jam sessions. He took me in on a Sunday afternoon to the Colored Musicians Club when I was about 12, I'm, I'm thinking, 11 to 12 years old. Donato, I, I walked into that room. It was like someone had taken me into outer space. I'd never been around black people. I'd never been around jazz. I'd never been around people going, hey, Eddie, how you doing? And my dad going, I'm cool, man. You know, but I'm like, who is this? What, what is going on, right? You were discovering a part of your father's life that you had never seen. Exactly. And, 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 and obviously for, for me, it, it was a start of, uh, of a love for, for music, you know, writ large, right? And, um, uh, and, and I'll, never, I'll never forget that day. And uh, I mean, I can literally still feel it you know, walking in because it was so different from any, you know, there was no black people where we lived, right? Yeah. My dad was the janitor at our church, which was a whole societal thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and and now he takes me to, to, to this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to this. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was really something, it changed my life, literally changed my life. Was music, the, was music the driving force between your parents' relationship, do you think? I have I, I have thoughts. They met at a USO evening in in uh, Southampton, England during World War II. Mm -hmm. the, in those days, the the black troops were segregated. So right. Somehow, my mother, who was an opera singer, so who had a career, right, uh, decided she would go volunteer sing for at this USO evening, right? And that's how they met. And my dad asked my mom to dance afterwards. And, and, and here's, you'll love this. This is, I never talk about this because it can be construed so many ways. But my, Larry Moss said, one night he said, your mother, British, maybe 22, 23 years old, uh, singing opera, that's all she knows. And here comes this swinging black dude who grabs her and says, let's dance. He yeah. said, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> your mother was whoa, you know. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, music was obviously a, a a real part of the relationship. But I'm sure, you know, my dad sang with a guy named Leon Bibb, who who had a uh, was a folk singer uh, mm -hmm. before the war. Um, and I think I think that dad thought, I'm we're going to go back after the war, and I'm going to get back 
you know, singing jazz. And my wife is sing opera. And what happened was they came back to us to a world that didn't welcome them. Right. You know, with my sister Gail and I. And uh, that's when they had to move out of it. My dad got jumped one day by some guy who and the police walked away when he realized mom was who which one was mom's husband and that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. they're there, all of those dreams, you know, went away. They had to raise kids. So I think music was was a part of it. And that's what I loved. And was a, it was supported, too. It was mm-hmm. supported. You know, I wanted to play trombone. So they got me a trombone. You know, I, I wanted to sing. So they made sure I sang. I wanted to be in the March of the Wooden Soldiers. So they made sure I had a, a little gold costume. You know, so it was supported. You know, I always uh, uh, I always ask this question about sort of the the, traje- uh, the the trajectory of a of a career or of a um, of a life in music and I always uh, I always discovered because it certainly happened with me was that there are also aside from the, the, the possibility of having a home life that's connected to music there are also teachers along the way in high school college what have you that and they could not they may not even be music teachers but um, there are some, there are some teachers along the way that just spark that that inner person that person in you to come out. Who, Did you have one? Did you have one of those? Oh yeah, I have one. Yeah. Oh yeah. My high school, my high school band director. Okay. My Spanish teacher. Your what? My Spanish teacher. Uh huh. In high school, uh, I by by my senior year, I was so disinterested. I already had a band, and we would be working and 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 stuff, and I barely got out of got out of high school and it was my Spanish teacher who went to the principal and said, this kid has represented our little stupid school. She probably didn't say that Uh, musically since he's been here, all state band, all state choir, you know, singing, you you know, blah, 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 blah. You got, we have to find a way to get, get him through and get him out of here. So I think she said, he's not passing. I'm going to give him a C, you know? So, but she understood what was my my driving force was, you know, that mm-hmm. I didn't really care about any of this, you know. I, I was about music already, you know. So yeah, she she got it and helped me, you know, move on. Move on. Amazing. Did yeah. so you when you graduated from high school, what did you think you were gonna be? Were you gonna be a rock star? Or were you gonna be a jazz singer? Were you gonna be a uh, you know what? I was gonna be a singer. I, I, was yeah. gonna be, I don't think I had to find it. I tell you, I have, I have all these stories that I, I, I think of now as we're talking. Um, so uh, I went to college for a year at Fredonia. Mm-hmm. Right? Music. That's yeah. where I met Bill Payne. Bill, Bill was a, a music major there, and I was a music major there. And when Bill, 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 Bill by the way, is on, Bill's watching. He said he's, he says hi. Okay, Bill and I have this famous story we used to use in the show, which was uh, Bill, uh, Bill and I met in college. Uh, and, and Bill and, I, and Bill would say, yeah, you flunked out and I graduated. And then I would say, yeah, now you work for me. So it was like, <laughs> you know? but Billy and I had this and still have this great symbiotic relationship. We love each other as people. And he's been like the main force in my my career, musically speaking, forever. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But I flunked out, which in 1965 meant oh. Vietnam. Right. Yes. So I found out that there was a music program in the army. So if you joined, you could get in the music program. If you were drafted, it was whatever, right? So I joined um, and my trombone and I were sent to uh, Little Creek, Virginia, which is where the Army Navy School of Music was to learn all the marches, right? Um, And so in the midst of it, I kept saying to these people there, I said, you know, I'm a way better singer than I am a trombone player. And they said, well, we, we, we don't need singers, you know, which is the only time I ever heard that in my life. We don't need singers, we need trombone players. <laughs> so I went along my way. And this is another turning point in my life. General William Westmoreland, who was the head of the army in those days, whatever that means, saw a concert in Washington at the White House with the army chorus and noticed that there were no people of color in the entire chorus. So he sent out a missive to the School of Music and probably other places, we need some people of color in the chorus. They sent me to Washington, I auditioned and became the only African-American in the United States Army Chorus for uh, the period of time that, that, that I was there. So it was just luck of the draw. A, I didn't have to go to Vietnam, and B, I got to sing uh, in the United States Army Chorus the last two years of my Army career. And I sang at the White House, I sang you know, wherever. And I started my career in Washington, you know. Uh, 
So it, it was really good fortune, really good fortune. You know, uh, it, it, this story reminds me so much of how, and this may not be so much the case anymore, but how much the military, uh, in terms of music, how much music and culture there was in the military, and how there's, you know, these these bands, these right. choruses, these orchestras, even the orchestras, they're all over. When I was in the chorus, you got to remember, it was Vietnam. So they had the, the creme de la creme of singers who didn't want to go to Vietnam. You know, I mean, the, the, uh, Richard Stilwell, uh, um, the, got, Richard saying with the Met, you know, once he got out of the Army yeah. Corps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 I can't think of his name right now, but he became the most famous German leader singer. Uh, William, ah, uh, anyway, uh, all these brilliant singers who went on to have major careers. And, and mm -hmm. then a lot of them stayed in and made their career singing in the Army Chorus, which is not a bad career. But right. a, lot, a lot of them were like me, just kind of marking time and 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 um, having these. Uh, you know, it's funny because one of the first things when I got in, I realized was how lame I was in terms of the greatness of the classically trained singers in that chorus. Because I'd had some training, and I, I you know, my mom had trained me, and blah 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 blah. But I was nowhere near what the Richard Stillwell, William Parker, that was his name, the, uh, William, the Richard Stillwells were. These guys were amazing, right? So I get a call in, we're singing at Carnegie Hall, and the, the uh, captain says, uh, we, we, we have a solo for you. And this is maybe two months after I was, I, you have a solo for me? You know, that's really what I felt. Well, the solo was, got to jump down, spin around, pick a bale of cotton. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh so, <laughs> so, yeah, so. <laughs> Gotta jump down, spin around, pick up air. Yeah. So uh, that was my solo. <laughs> oh my God, the stories. <laughs> um, we have another video I want to share with 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 uh, with the folks that are watching. This is uh, this is from Symphony Space, also uh, uh, in New York City, uh, the Fiddler at uh, Fifty Gala, which is. Um, which was an incredible event. I love, I love this event. Yeah. Tell us how, how, how you got connected to this. And this, this is just wonderful. Well, Jim Caruso, uh, who I'm sure you know, Jim, uh, yeah. books Birdland and uh, blah, 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 uh, asked me uh, to do a, a number at, at this. And I was like thrilled, um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, so I, I, so he said, to, uh, if I was a rich man, well, I started playing with it, and I called him up, and I said, because Sheldon Harnick was going to be there, right? And, and, right? and I said, would anybody be offended if I took a jazz approach to the song? And Jim said, well, I, I trust your taste that you're not going to make it so outlandish, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I started messing with it, and I worked with uh, John McDaniel in New York, uh, and we put together this, and believe me, Walking up to the stage, I was still going, am I nuts? Are they going to, you know what I mean? Are they going to throw me out of here? Is it, and uh, and so I got to do this jazz version of, of, uh, of If I Was a Rich Man. Yeah. Let's watch it. Okay. If I was a rich man, should do baby, do I do baby, do I know that all day long I'd be the be the boom. If I was a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work hard. Should do baby, do 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 Said if I was a bit a bit rich, shuba do ba ya do bo man. I'd build a big tall house with rooms by the dozen right in the middle of a town. A fine tin roof with real wooden floors below. 
And there'd be one long staircase just going up, weren't even longer going down. And one more leading nowhere, just for show, you know, you know. Oh, if I was a rich man, should a day bo baby do 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 bow. Said all day long, I did de be de bo. Said if I was a wealthy man, and I know that I wouldn't ever work hard. Should do 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 ba do ba. Should do de da do yo do. If I was a bit of a devil, I'd shoot my new bad over world, and then I'd see my wife, my gold, looking like a rich man's wife, with a proper double chin, supervising meals to her heart's delight. And she'd be putting on hair, strutting like a peacock boy. What a happy mood she lived. Screaming at the servants day and night, do it right. Oh my goodness, if you're gonna do it, do it right. If I were rich, I'd have the time that I lack to sit in the synagogue and pray. Maybe have a seat by the eastern wall. And I'll discuss the holy books with the learned men seven hours every day. That would be the greatest, sweetest gift of all. <laughs> Oh, if I was a rich man, I'd know that all day long I'd be the beautiful. If I was a wealthy man, and I know that I'd never have to work hard to eat me, be the devil, Lord, who made the lion and the lamb? You decreed I should be what I am. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I was a wealthy man? Will you do today? I can see, by the way, just a slight bit that you were a trombone player with your right hand and you scat. Yeah, I do that. I do that. <laughs> I couldn't play it. If you said play that, I'd be like, <laughs> but I, <laughs> you know, uh, tell us a little bit. You know, I, I loved your, um, your album that came out <clears throat> 2017 called Thank Rendezvous. You. Thank you. Such a beautiful album. Tell us about songwriting for you, because you know there are many wonderful, wonderful singers who don't compose, don't write songs, and that's totally cool. Yeah. But um, where did this songwriting uh, habit come? When did that happen? Was it something you always did along the way? No, and I wish I had. Uh, the, the the very short version is I, I had a hit record back in 1974. My name is Michael. I got a nickel, which I did not write. But they would send me out to Los Angeles. I lived in Washington, D.C. at the time. They'd send me out to L.A. to meet with, uh, with uh, publishers to find songs for the next CD. And I formed a great relationship with a guy named Rick Shoemaker who kept saying to me, why aren't you writing? I mean, you know, you understand what a good song is. You know, we sit here and listen to songs, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and he said, you need to start writing. So actually, Bill Fain and I wrote, because uh, I was working with Bill all, all the time then, we we wrote a lot of songs together then, um, at that, which is kind of when I started to write. And then um, I, I decided to write a um, musical back in 1996 uh, um, for the Paper Mill Playhouse in mm -hmm. uh, New Jersey. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote a 
um, uh, I co-wrote um, a, a musical with a man named Nelson Cole. I wrote the book and the lyrics, Nelson wrote the music, uh, which was produced there called Comfortable Shoes. And that's when I really became, in my mind, a songwriter because I actually wrote uh, a play, you know, a musical play. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's, it's as much a part of my life as performing is. In fact, this last year, it's been way more a part of my life than performing is because there's no place to perform. So I have been, you know, writing literally every day with different writers, um, ideas. I, I love writing. It, someone would say to me, if somehow you could not perform again, what would you do? It would be right. You know, I, I, I love it's as satisfying as going out on stage in, in a different way. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, that's a whole other uh, such an interesting skill set, right? Because you, you know you come at that, you come at that. I would, I'm guessing, you, when you're thinking of a lyric, does does it does it start out as a lyric, as something you're voicing, something you're singing, something? What what what's that process for you? I prefer her hearing music. I, I most of the people I write with <clears throat> write music, so I yeah. would say, send me a melody. Send uh -huh. me a melody. You know, and then I'll just listen and listen and listen. Unless it's, I mean, if I'm writing a play or something, then it's obviously there's a, it's got to move the story along. So there's a reason to write. But if it's just writing a song, I'll just let the music sink in until uh, a lyric idea uh, comes about. You know, so it usually starts with the music for me. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. Our hour. Go ahead. What's that? Oh, I'm just, our hour has just flown by. Oh, we're done? Good see you. <laughs> I mean, we could continue talking for, for I know as, as we can continue this for quite a while, but um, I just want to thank you so much for, for joining, joining me on, on this. You know, we, it, this is all, this is also doing this show is, is, is personal as these are, because I just miss, miss you. I miss all of these folks that have been on here and we would be normally doing this, you know, over dinner or, uh, you know, just chatting on the street. And so um, I miss you. Can't wait to do this in person. I had looked forward to this so much. And last week when we were uh, challenged technically in the Holmes household, it was so disappointing. So I'm glad we got to do this. I appreciate you inviting me. It's been really fun. And I, I can't, I miss you too. I miss all of us. I miss um, with my friends, as they say. Well, I know that you, uh, as you did, uh, uh, and we, again, this is another story altogether, but when, when we have the opportunity to celebrate uh, publicly coming back as performers, mm -hmm. uh, as you helped in the past bringing folks together, I know that we'll, we'll be doing that together as well. So Can't wait. Can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching this week's Music Wise. See you next Tuesday.